Hey guys, Andres here, and in this video we are going to start the discussion of the King's Gambit Accepted, focusing on some popular alternatives for black, as well as discussing some minor lines on the move 3 for white. So, after moves e4, e5, and f4, black has a choice between accepting the gambit, counterattacking, and making any other move. So this time we're going to discuss e takes f4. First of all, there is nothing wrong with this move. Well, actually, black loses the control over d4 square, but black is getting extra pawn. Uh, as I have already mentioned in the introductory video, there is the weakness of the h4 e1 diagonal, and black may want to use it somehow. So white needs some preparation prior to get to active operations in the center. If white decides to play d4 immediately, which is actually uh, the first impulse here, Black may continue with the queen to h4 check. And this is already sort of problem for white because the king is under attack and g3 is impossible. So if white actually plays g3, then after f takes g3, there is not only the problem with the diagonal because now black has different threats, including g takes h2 with check or g2 with check. There is also a problem with the e4 pawn, which is attacked by the queen. So this is definitely not good for white. That's why the king is forced to move. And usually the king goes to e2, which looks super ugly, I understand. But it's not necessarily that simple for black to punish white for it. Actually, there is no direct way to win the game whatsoever. But black may use this uh, temporal disadvantage. So the king is definitely in the wrong place. And uh, the problem is not necessarily in this king itself. Uh, but mainly uh, the problem is with the bishop on f1, which cannot move to a normal active square c4. On the other hand, queen on h4 is quite vulnerable and white is intending to play knight to f3 next move attacking it. So I would say that uh, black has plenty of different options here, but the one uh, I find the most um, important is actually queen back to e7. So queen has done its job on h4, so force the king to a bad position. Now it's time to go back, but uh, why go back to d8 if uh, there is a nice option of attacking e4 pawn? White normally protects it with a knight to c3 move, for instance. Black may continue the attack against e4 with the development move knight to f6. And, uh, well, in the vast majority of cases, when we see something similar to this, e4, e5 would be just okay for white. In this particular case, it's not necessarily that pleasant because black has a chance to play d6, attacking the pawn using the fact that this pawn is pinned. Uh, which means that uh, the pawn is under attack, king is still in the e-file, and there is also a problem with the d4 potentially because black is going to play some like knight to c6. And even if white protects the pawn e5 and d4 with the knight f3 move, there is additional option of attacking the things with uh, bishop to g4, pinning the knight to the king and potentially to the queen. So e5 is not necessarily that good. Instead, uh, white may try queen to d3 move. Again, it feels like white uh, actually violates all the opening principles, moving the king, then moving the queen at so early stage. But again, position is not necessarily that simple. In this position, uh, black once again has different options, but I would recommend to play something like d5. And uh, after that, white no longer has a normal choice because e4 is attacked several times. It is pinned. If black manages to take the e4 pawn, it's over. So now e5 is definitely forced. And the nice thing for black here is that e5 is pinned, so it's not a real attack against the knight. Instead of moving the knight somewhere, black may spend time uh, usefully by placing the knight on c6. And the idea behind this move is not only to exert some pressure in d4, uh, black may think of playing knight to b4 as near as the next move, attacking the queen and pawn on c2. Another uh, potential threat is bishop to f5, because as you may notice, d4 is not protected well, and if queen captures the bishop, then there is knight d4 with a fork. So this position is already quite um, interesting for black to play, and white has to make accurate moves uh, just to get a decent play. But don't be uh, super excited about this if you, whenever, get this position as black. So position remains very complicated.
Anyways, d4 is not considered the most ambitious option, uh, mainly because of this strange position of the king. Although, in some cases, white is not against to move the king if he gets some decent play in the center. But anyway, white has much better options uh, to build up a center uh, using, you know, more natural moves here. Uh, so the main one is knight to f3, that is our main focus here in this video. But before doing uh, anything connected to knight f3, I would like to mention the bishop to c4 option. So we're not covering bishop c4 in details here, but it's also a possible move and it is one of the two most popular ones. So they are knight f3 and bishop c4. It may be referred as a bishop gambit, while knight to f3 is a knight gambit. So what is the point behind bishop c4? It's clear white develops the bishop, starts exerting pressure on f7 and controls d5 square better than before. It still allows the check on h4, but I think in this particular case it's not that clear because after queen h4 king may go to f1. Uh, e2 is obviously uh, possible, but f1 is much more natural position. Um, anyway, queen h4 is a nice option, we may use it a bit later. For now, it's better to uh, continue the development. One of the uh, most interesting things about the king's gambit is that uh, black, if he wants to get safe position, doesn't have to uh, fight for the extra pawn. It's not necessary. In some cases, it's even important uh, to give up the extra pawn just to simplify the development. Uh, one of these cases is here. So d7, d5 looks very attractive for black here because it is a tempo move and uh, black either forces the uh, change of the pawn structure, I mean after e takes d5 white will have doubled pawns, or forces the bishop to d5 which will be quite vulnerable there. So let's start with the e takes d5 which looks safer than bishop takes d5. It doesn't allow black to play knight f6 with the tempo. And exactly here I guess black may consider playing queen to h4 check. So king is forced to not very good position on f1 and black as you may notice has no problems with development of his pieces. So everything is uh, open here in the center and uh, bishops uh, have nice possibilities uh, almost everywhere. Uh, I guess bishop d6 is pretty logical here although the bishop is a bit limited with the f4 pawn but here it plays another important role. It blockades the d5 pawn, uh, which means white no longer has the simple way to activate the light squid bishop, which is limited with this pawn. Additionally, this bishop supports the f4, which is our extra pawn, well, x extra pawn. Uh, it's no longer extra, but it's still very important controlling some key squares like e3 and g3. After bishop d6, white may continue with the knight to c3. Uh, now, it's possible to develop the knight to f6, but another interesting route is through e7 to f5. Why? Because sometimes when the king is on f1 and rook is on h1, h2 pawn may be pinned and knight will get some interesting options of getting to either g3 or maybe e3 a bit later when white plays d4. Uh, for instance, white continues with the d4 because it's uh, anyway uh, needed somehow because white wants to develop his dark squid bishop and exert some pressure on f4 pawn. Black may castle here. Knight goes to f3 attacking the queen and one of the uh, easiest ways to get back with the queen is to occupy h6 square. Uh, why here? Well, because here the queen can still controls h file and this means h2 is pinned and black exactly has this knight f5 knight g3 threat. At the same time, the queen supports f4 in controlling e3, so black may also consider playing knight f5 and knight to e3. So white may continue with knight e4 here, uh, placing the knight uh, on this normal central position, exerting some pressure on the bishop, maybe intending to occupy c5, but it's not clear in this particular case uh, why this c5 is necessary so good. So uh, knight e4 is just a normal continuation uh, for white here. Another idea may be just to play c3 to overprotect d4, maybe to activate the queen later. Black shouldn't be afraid of losing the bishop in this particular case because in that case uh, after knight d6 black may recapture with the pawn. Again, still blockading these pawns and keeping this bishop quite passive 
at the same time controlling e5 square preventing white's knight f3 from going there. Uh, so one of the possibilities here is just to play knight to d7. Continuing the development with the temple, creating the threat of just playing knight b6, attacking the bishop and the pawn. Um, white may try something like bishop to b3 to be able to play c4 against knight to b6. And here black may go to f5 with the knight. So another idea behind knight to d7 is actually to put it on f6 at some point to exchange the central knight and to simplify the things a bit. For now white has to think what to do with weakened squares. For instance, if uh, white goes crazy on the queen side and starts c4, then knight to e3 is pretty good. After bishop takes e3 and pawn takes e3, position becomes more and more open, which is good for black because now black has a pair of bishops and also because of the king. So we'll have uh, some nice attacking possibilities as black if we will manage to open the position even more. Uh, for instance, if white continues with the logical c5, grabbing the space here, bishop goes to f4, supporting the pawn on e3, and it doesn't feel like black has problems, but it uh, does feel like white has some. Uh, for example, light squares may be seriously weakened after white's g3 move, so black may attack the knight very soon, this pawn is really annoying, and once the bishop joins the fight, white will have serious problems. So, it is about e takes d5, let's quickly look at bishop takes d5 as the major alternative against d7, d5. So white captures on d5 with the bishop, not damaging own pawn structure, but another problem with this is knight to f6 move. So uh, black develops the knight with the temple. Uh, black is really uh, fast in developing his king side here and uh, white is having problems because if bishop goes away then we may capture an e4. So normally white responds with the knight to c3 move where after black can get the uh, pair of bishops after simple capturing on d5. There are different options again how to proceed from here but one of the lines may be like bishop to d6 developing the bishop and protecting the pawn on f4. After knight to f3 simple castling. Uh, white continues with the d4 uh, grabbing some space in the center Black plays rook to e8, using the fact that king is still in the center on e1 and attacking e4, which is not protected. White continues with the e5, similarly winning the pawn, because black doesn't want to play g5 here. So something like bishop f8 should be played, attacking the knight. Knight captures on f4, so white is a pawn up at the moment. But black has very nice compensation here, just starting the active operations in the center. So c5 undermining the pawn, let's say c3. We capture on d4, white captures on d4, and after bishop to g4, uh, black definitely has a serious compensation for a pawn. Knight is pinned, d4 is potentially under pressure, black is going to continue with knight to c6. So uh, it's clear that for uh, some time white will be defending here, and this is ag against the spirit of the opening, because white was supposed to attack here. Uh, in general, I believe this position is more or less balanced. Now let's get to the main line, which is uh, third move knight to f3. So after black captures the pawn on f4, white responds with the knight to f3. Now after understanding the problems with the h4 e1 diagonal, I guess you uh, may grasp the uh, power of this move because h4 check is no longer possible. Uh, white better controls central squares and something like d4 may be played a bit later. From here, uh, black has a variety of different uh, possibilities. Uh, in this video I wanted to focus mainly on uh, crazy looking g5 move and the Fisher defense which starts uh, after d6. So let's start with the g5 uh, what is the idea behind this move? Well, it's simple. Black just protects the pawn and intends at some point just to play g4 to attack the knight. Again, creating a threat of queen h4 probably. Um, but sometimes uh, it is only about fighting for uh, central squares because knight controls them. Another idea behind g5 may be just to put the bishop on g7 to develop it uh, on a position which is not vulnerable to different attacks uh, from white's pieces in the center and to control some important squares uh, in the center as well. 
Um, so here I have to mention it right now what has very sharp opportunity it is bishop to c4 with the idea to respond to g4 move with castling which leads us to so-called Mutsu Gambit that we are going to discuss in the next video. For now let's focus on another possibility which also looks pretty attractive. It is h4 undermining the g5 pawn immediately not giving black time to play bishop g7 and protect the rook so ensuring that black may not want to play h6 in this situation because in that case white simply captures on g5 and as you may notice rook is handing so after h takes g5 white simply captures it with own rook so this definitely leads to damaged pawn structure instead of playing uh, h6 or anything black continues with the g4 tempo move attacking the knight uh, there are different options, but let's focus on knight to e5, which looks supernatural. Just putting the knight in the center and attacking g4 pawn twice with a knight and with a queen. If black keeps on protecting pawns here, it may quickly go wrong because f7 is already under pressure. White may want to play bishop c4 next move, simply attacking it, it may be very annoying. And after black played g4, f4 is no longer that protected. So if white quickly castles and captures that pawn, it may be just a disaster. So right now, it's time for black to forget about the pawn and think of the development. There is an option of playing d6 here. Attacking the knight, forcing it to g4, and continuing the development with the temple. So knight goes to f6. After that, what has two options? Just to step back with the knight to f2 or to capture the knight on f6. So let's start with uh, the knight to f2. Uh, let's assume that white wants to keep as many pieces on the board as possible, just to have more attacking resources. It appears that in this position, uh, since there is no g pawn on the board anymore, but has no problems with protecting f4. And another change of the pawn structure, which is significant, is uh, something that leads to this uh, weakness on g3. So black may use this weakness a bit later. For now, black just plays rook to g8. Very interesting move, just developing the rook at so early stage, but controlling the g-file, preventing white from developing the light script bishop here, and exerting additional pressure on g3. Uh, white continues with the d4, which is supernatural. Black protects the f4 from h6 with the bishop. So here bishop looks not so active, but it may change uh, rather quickly, and it supports the pawn in control in e3. White may play knight to c3, uh, developing the knight. Black continues with the development as well, knight to c6. Let's say uh, white decides to do something active in the center, because if white doesn't do anything, then it's not clear how to develop the pieces. Pawn f4 limits the bishop c1, and bishop f1 is limited because of the rook, exerting some pressure on g2. Uh, one of the popular lines uh, of the past was knight to d5, where after black can capture and after e d5 to give this check. This is super annoying because uh, now if uh, queen goes to e2, d4 drops. So going with the king to d2 is stupid because of queen e3 checkmate. So the only move is actually bishop to e2 where after black puts the knight on b4 and this proves to be uh, really efficient, attacking d5 and exerting pressure on uh, c2. After c4, black plays bishop to f5, a creating a threat of uh, knight to c2. Queen goes to a4 and king goes to f8, surprising sacrifice of the knight, but look at the position that is arising after that. Queen takes b4, now rook jumps to e8. All black's pieces are already in a play and white is super underdeveloped and the king is in danger. So queen goes to d2, rook captures on g2, and black is really close to develop the decisive initiative here because black has threats like f3 a bit later when the bishop will be not capturable with check, and also some ideas uh, based on the great position of the rook on the second uh, line. So king goes to f1, rook goes to g3, queen goes to d1, sort of preventing f3 in advance, but then bishop goes to e4, exerting additional pressure on white's position. After rook goes to h2, uh, trying to cover most critical squares, black continues with the f5, and it starts looking just uh, very bad for white, and it's bad indeed. Because if white captures on e4, black recaptures with a pawn and has super powerful pawns on f4 and e4, continuing the attack. Another idea behind f5 is just to bring the queen to g7, and after that there will be a threat of a checkmate. So, that means uh, going with the knight to f2 is not so good, 
that's why uh, normally you would see something like knight takes f6. So let's have a look at that line. So in this situation, instead of going back to f2, where it captures on f6, and after queen takes f6, black develops the queen to a better position, supporting the f4 pawn. Um, after this move, obviously white wants to continue the development and plays knight to c3, intending to bring the knight to either d5 or b5, attacking c7, which was weakened after the queen went away from d8. And it appears that black may ignore it, uh, simply playing knight to c6. So what's the point here? After knight jumps to d5, uh, given that diagonal is super weak, especially g3 square is weak, black may create a threat of queen g3 check, and it's not only the threat of a check. So here, if knight captures on c7, let's say, and king goes to d8, attacking the knight. White is losing the piece because in case the knight goes away somewhere, let's say captures the rook, there is just a checkmate in two. So queen goes to g3, forcing the king to e2, and then either bishop g4 or knight to d4, both leading to a checkmate. So white cannot afford it. Uh, the problem is that it's not so simple to cover g3 square here. Uh, pay attention that bishop c8 controls h3, so rook cannot go to h3 here. Taking on f4 with the knight leads to losing the knight and the checkmate as well after queen to g3. So you choose what to take. Uh, so appears that the only normal defense for white here is actually d3 move. Because if white tries to do something like queen to f3, covering the square with the queen, there is an attack after knight to d4. For example, queen goes to d3, trying to cover c2, which was hanging, and still controlling g3. Uh, black may take on c2, deflecting the queen from uh, g3 square, and after queen takes c2, queen to g3, black continues the attack using the light square bishop now. King has to go to d1, then uh, bishop jumps to g4, bishop goes to e2, again the only move, we take the bishop, then we take on g2. Uh, if king goes to the first rank, we just take the rook with the temple, so the only move here is king to d3. Now queen can capture the rook on h1, and even though white captures on c7, and after uh, king to d7 move captures the rook, having the extra minor piece at the moment, uh, black's pieces are much better coordinated here, and after queen to f3, forcing the king to a uh, super vulnerable position in the center, d4 is very bad because of bishop g7 check, so king to c4 is the only move, but then bishop g7 is played anyway, the knight is attacked, and rook c8 is coming, so it's just a disaster for white. Let's get back a bit and uh, have a look at the d3, the only decent defense against queen to g3. So d3 prepares the square d2 for the king. Super ugly, but what, what else? So queen goes to g3 in this case, king runs to d2, through d2 to c3, and uh, it appears that, uh, well, black doesn't have anything decisive in this situation. So the king is definitely running away. Uh, it's uh, actually proved by practice. Uh, one of the interesting possibilities for black here is to try knight to e7 move. And uh, it was proven to be, uh, you know, a nice way to end the game in the draw, because after that, white normally captures on c7. King goes to d8 square. The rook is being captured after knight takes a8. And here, black has a perpetual check. So queen goes to e3, king runs to c3. It's important to stick to perpetual here because if black makes a mistake and overestimates his position after bishop to g7, uh, white's king is hiding. So uh, the king goes to b3. Pay attention that this uh, strange knight on a8 is actually playing a very important role controlling b6 square, so there is no follow-up like queen to b6. The only follow-up is bishop to e6, but then white just plays c4 and king is safe. So it goes through c2 to a safe place here. So instead of doing this, obviously black continues with the perpetual check like this. Queen c5, king b3, queen b5, and so on. So once the king is back to d2, there is queen to e3 with a draw. So it's a nice uh, line. Of course, we didn't cover all the possibilities for black here. You may uh, make your own research. Uh, but after g5, if white plays h4, I guess it's uh, pretty straightforward and black has uh, at least a draw like in this line. 
So now let's get back and discuss the Fischer defense, which starts with the third move, d6. So now that you have the understanding of what happens after g5, g4, I mean this line with knight to e5, the d6 move may look no longer that surprising. Yes, we leave it on bishop on f8, but we do control e5 square, preventing knight from going there. And after white's most natural d4 move, we may consider the g5 as the main response. So after g5, we control f4, we support it, we are ready to play g4. Now, white's knight doesn't have e5 square anymore. And what's important here, we prepare bishop to g7. So uh, white has to think about it. Uh, because uh, if white doesn't, then we will have very solid position on the king side, although we will have some advanced pawns that may look a bit vulnerable. So white has two general options here, to either undermine the pawn g5 with the h4, or to continue the development with the bishop to c4. Let's start with the h4. It looks more ambitious. The problem though, after g4, white doesn't have a good square to go away. Uh, I mean, if knight goes to g5 now, then after something like h6, white uh, is obliged to sacrifice a piece, which is not necessarily that dangerous for black. Knight doesn't have e5 square, so uh, the most logical now is something like knight to g1, because from there, the knight can at least go to e2, attacking the f4. Uh, black may continue with the queen f6 here. I believe it is the most convincing continuation supporting the pawn f4 and exerting some pressure on d4. White continues with the knight c3, again intending to bring the knight to d5. Uh, black may pair it with knight to e7 move, again a development combined with the prophylaxis, so d5 is controlled now. White continues with knight to e2, attacking f4, and black may protect it with the bishop to h6 move. Uh, so now it's not clear how to proceed with white here. One of the options is to undermine f4, basically, with the g3. Uh, the point being that if black, for some reason, plays f3 here, which at first glance looks amazing because black creates a sort of taking the knight and playing f2 um, with the checkmate, white may put the knight on f4, which is a very solid position, and now it's very hard for black to break through, while white is simply building very strong center. Instead, Black should rather take on g3 in this situation. And after uh, knight captures on g3, black exchanges uh, dark squid bishops with this move. And after rook takes c1, because it's more or less forced, d4 was under pressure. So queen has to stay here to uh, protect the pawn. Black continues with the simple knight to c6, attacking this pawn. And it feels like black's position is already quite comfortable, while white has uh, some weaknesses here and didn't necessarily achieve anything significant in the center. So h4 doesn't look that uh, attractive unless white plays knight g5 and goes crazy with the sacrifice on f7 or something like that. So now let's get back to the development of the light squared bishop. So white decides not to undermine the pawn, not to do anything specific here on the king side, instead developing the bishop to the active position. So now this h4 becomes an actual threat because then knight will go to g5 attacking f7 and it's gonna be very annoying. But that is exactly uh, when black may continue with one of the main ideas here. So bishop goes to g7, uh, protecting the rook in advance. And now whenever white plays something like h4, it's possible just to protect the pawn with the h6. For example, something like this may not be that good for white because white doesn't really achieve anything with his exchanges while black still had an extra pawn, g3 is weakened, and so on. So normally white uh, simply castles. So let's have a look at that move. So white is castling here after bishop to g7. Uh, black may protect the pawn in advance just to forget about this issue and focus on the development after that. For example, c3 supporting the pawn, then knight goes to c6. And this is a critical position. I mean, if white doesn't find anything significant uh, starting from here, uh, it may be considered one of the best options for black and king's gambit. Uh, because what is considered uh, really cool, I mean g3, undermining the f4 pawn, trying to open up the f file and continue with the attack against f7 using the rook, the bishop, everything just according to one of the main ideas in this opening. 
Black may ignore this move and uh, continue with the bishop to h3, just counterattacking. So here white has a choice between just moving the rook away, where after knight goes to f6, and the pawn e4 is under pressure. It appears that black may take this pawn just next move. Another idea is knight to g4, for example. So let's say g takes f4, knight captures on e4, looks dangerous, but there is nothing wrong with this capture, because after queen to e1 and d5, defending the knight the first time, and after knight d2, protecting it twice with both pawns, black's position looks really cool. So this is not an option, most likely. Uh, white may try sacrificing the exchange a bit earlier, just right after uh, bishop to h3 move. Right after bishop to h3, taking the pawn on f4. So now black takes on f1, queen takes on f1. Uh, well, white has a pair of bishops now and pretty impressive center, but it still doesn't feel like enough compensation for missing material. Black may continue with the queen d7, preparing different things, including queen to g4 check or maybe even castling long. So position remains complicated, just like any similar position in King's Gambit. So white definitely has some practical compensation, but again, I don't feel like it's enough. So to summarize, uh, we have discussed one of the most popular alternatives for black, also uh, allocating some time to alternatives for white on the move three. I think now you have a sensation what King's Gambit is. Uh, there are weird things all around uh, the center, diagonal h4, e1, and sometimes on diagonal a2, g8. Uh, we mentioned some sidelines, but uh, for a better understanding of the opening, you definitely need to make your own research and learn it better than it was covered here in this video. But anyway, you should have now some uh, sort of basic sensation of what this opening is. In the next video, we're going to discuss the Mutsu Gambit, which is extremely sharp. And uh, if you have never learned that gambit, uh, you will be definitely interested in what is uh, going to be covered. So I'm uh, happy to see you in the next video.